Okay, let's continue with some of the parts of the axial skeleton and parts of the bones. The next thing that we want to look at is the anterior fontanelle. Now, fontanelle is the technical name of what a lot of people call soft spots in an infant skull. And the anterior fontanelle is the last one to close up. So let's look at that. I've got this fetal skull. You can see all the different bones we've been talking about and how when they were forming, every all your skeleton used to be hyaline cartilage, but it's, it started ossifying at different ages. And uh, certain parts, of course, when a baby's born, it still has certain parts of these soft areas called fontanelles left open. So the one you're responsible for is the last one to close, the one that basically joins the frontal bone and the parietal bones together. So it's up in this area. Okay, the next area is not a skull bone, but it's the only bone that isn't attached or articulating with any other bone, and that's the hyoid bone. It actually is uh, connected to your larynx region. So you can see it is in the upper neck region, uh, and when we talk about the larynx later on, we'll probably bring it back up. So uh, again, it's the only bone not articulating, but it does have muscles from your tongue that attach to it. And so uh, it's often checked to see in strangulations or something to see if it's broken. So anyway, uh, anyway, that's kind of a morbid thing to say, but it is true. So uh, again, it's this uh, kind of U-shaped bone or C-shaped bone that is in your upper neck. Okay, the next thing we want to look at is our actual vertebral column which is made up of individual vertebrae. And so notice that if I pull both, this, both of these things up, we actually have a number of vertebrae. So we actually have seven cervical vertebrae, and they are numbered from the top to the bottom. C1 would be the top vertebrae, also called the ax atlas. C2 is the next vertebrae. It's also called the axis. Then the third vertebrae would be called our C3, C4, C5, and C6 and then C7 vertebrae. So we actually have seven cervical vertebrae. This says C1 through C6, but it's actually C1 through C7. Okay. Then we actually, our next vertebrae would be our thoracic vertebrae, which is T1 through T12. And then finally, our last actual vertebrae are our lumbar vertebrae, which is L1 through L5. Okay. Then after that, we actually have our sacrum, which is kind of a, um, the, you know, it's still part of the axial skeleton, and uh, uh, it's kind of fused vertebrae, and then the coccyx is your literal tailbone. So again, numbers would be good to know. Seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae. Now you can maybe remember that, that a lot of people eat breakfast at seven, lunch at 12, and supper at five. So if you do eat supper at six, don't confuse that with the number of vertebrae in your lumbar region. So again, notice the first seven vertebrae here would be cervical. The next 12 vertebrae here would be thoracic. The last five vertebrae would be lumbar. Now, the first seven vertebrae, uh, you know, they go increasingly from, from smaller to larger. So if I just had this vertebrae and one of those vertebrae out, you could probably say, yeah, that one's small, it must be cervical. That one's large, it must be lumbar. But the problem comes with what's the difference between the C7 and this T1 vertebrae? Because really, they're almost the same size. What's the difference in this T12 and this L1 vertebrae? Because they're really almost the same size. So besides size, what are some of the other distinguishing characteristics? So we're going to talk about that in a minute. First of all, though, I want you to notice that the vertebrae are not just perfectly straight up and down, but that we have these natural curves. So notice how we have this kind of curve here, curve here, and curve there. So notice when we say spinal curves, we're talking about the natural curves that are in each of those areas. And sometimes exaggerations of those curves lead to certain conditions. I'm sure most of you have heard of scoliosis, but uh, there are several other conditions that would be determined by the curve or the over curvature or even potentially a lack of curvature in certain areas. So let's look at this. What is it that basically all of the vertebrae have in common, no matter if they're cervical, thoracic, or lumbar? Well, they all have a spinous process. They all have a transverse process. They all have a body, even though the body is almost lacking in our, our C1 vertebrae. And they all have the vertebral foramen. We've learned by now that a foramen means a hole. So they have a hole that the spinal cord can run through. So let's look at those, and then we'll talk about 
how we, if we just picked up a vertebrae, how we could basically tell whether it was a cervical, thoracic, or lumbar vertebrae. So here's the structure of a typical vertebrae. In other words, what we see on here, we would pretty much see on most vertebrae. So again, the largest portion of the vertebrae would be the body. The hole that the spinal cord would run through, and the whole purpose of the vertebrae, or one of the main purposes, is to protect that spinal cord. So that hole here within the vertebrae would be the vertebral foramen. We would have a process, a protrusion off the bone, and which would the one that sticks straight out uh, is the spinous process. And this is the one that if you can feel, if you actually reach back and feel part of your 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 backbone, your vertebrae, that's what you're feeling. You're feeling that tip of the spinous process. And then protruding side to side is the transverse processes. Now let's look at the characteristics of cervical vertebrae. And the main characteristic that if I picked up any bone and I saw this characteristic that I'm going to talk about, which is transverse foramen, I know it's a cervical vertebrae. So notice that it not only has a vertebral foramen, but it also has little holes on the transverse or the side portions. So anytime I picked up a vertebrae, if I see that little hole there, a little hole there, the cervical vertebrae are the only ones that have that. So if I had a C7 vertebrae and I had a T1 vertebrae, the C7 would have transverse foramen, but none of the other vertebrae, including that T1, even though it would be about the same size as the C7, would have that transverse process. So that would be my first clue and main clue. The main distinguishing characteristic of the thoracic vertebrae are these things here called costal facets for ribs. In other words, there are 12, there are actually 12 thoracic vertebrae and all of them would have a rib attached to it. None of the cervical would have a rib attached to it. None of the lumbar would have a rib attached to it. But you can see that there can actually be more than one rib attached to an individual vertebrae, even though we only have 12 ribs. It's not necessarily a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one connection. So you can see that little hole there, that little hole, that little hole, that's representing this little area here, which is the, uh, which is the rib facet. Don't confuse the rib facet for the superior or inferior articular fast process and facet, which is like where they attach, one vertebrae attaches to another one. But notice out here, even I've got a facet for a rib, a rib would attach there. Here I could have a rib attached to this point or even to that point. Sometimes one rib will attach to more than one vertebrae. But bottom line for this is that thoracic vertebrae have ribs attached to it. So on them, I would not see any transverse foramen but I would see an area for a rib to attach. Then that leaves the lumbar vertebrae. And by the way, from the side, the thoracic vertebrae looks kind of like a giraffe with the long snout and the horns and the ears, whereas the lumbar vertebrae are bigger, for one thing. There's no transverse foramina, and there's no rib attachments for them. So there's only five of them. They get increasingly larger because they're bearing a biggie, a bigger amount of the weight on them. So again, I'm going to see the, I'm not going to see a, a rib, rib attachment or a transverse foramen on them, but I'm going to see a large, they're Spinous processes are what we call hatchet shaped. It almost gives them like a moose like appearance versus a giraffe like appearance because of the long, skinny spinous process. So, again, here we can see our curvature. We can see our first seven cervical vertebrae numbered C1, which is also called the atlas, C2, which is called the axis, and in C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, all of them would have transverse foramina. Here I've got my first, my T1. There's a rib attachment site on the sides of them. And then the, the thoracic would go down from T1 to T12. And then finally, it would have my lumbar. And again, you can see the curvature, cervical curvature kind of curving in, thoracic curvature kind of curving out, and then lumbar curvature curving in again. All right. Now, notice, though, this, all these large areas here would actually be the body of each vertebrae. But notice between each body, the body of this vertebrae does not attach to the body of that vertebrae. But instead, we have an intervertebral, an intervertebral disc made out of, uh, made out of fibrocartilage, the thickest of our cartilage. And that kind of gives it a uh, kind of a... Uh, a cushioning effect between each individual vertebrae. 
Now, notice that we've got intervertebral foramen, which is actually where the spinal nerves come out of the spinal cord. The spinal cord is running up and down, protected by this, what's called the arch of the vertebrae. The body is in front, the arch with the processes sticking out is around it. But coming out of the side here, out of these holes in the side, is actually spinal nerves. So when a intervertebral disc sometimes gets ruptured or slipped, it can slip into that and pinch that nerve. That's why a slip disc can be so painful. Okay, our next area is going to be our thoracic cage. We're still in the axial skeleton. So this is where our ribs and our sternum is going to be. And so the thoracic area... Again, notice that we had 12 uh, thoracic vertebrae and we have 12 ribs. The first seven are called true ribs, 8 through 12 are called false ribs, and 11 or 12 are called floating ribs. So let's look at that. Okay, we have a total of 12 ribs counting from the top to the bottom. So notice the first seven are called true. And notice that the first seven, they actually, you know, attach to, to actually cartilage here. And this is hyaline cartilage this blue area here. So we have kind of a one-to-one -one connection from basically the, you know, the rib facets on the thoracic vertebrae up to the sternum here. And so notice how that rib comes around and kind of attaches to cartilage. It goes directly to the sternum, to the cartilage, to the sternum. And so the first seven are basically like that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I can follow the cartilage directly to the sternum. Now the false ribs, notice they still, the, the, the false ribs are going to be everything below that, but the the uh, uh, 8 through 12, notice that either our last two actually do not attach to any cartilage, but 8 through 10, they do attach. So if that's rib 12, rib 11, then this would be rib 10. Notice it attaches to a common piece of cartilage. So ribs 10, 9, and 8 all connect to the same little piece. They don't all have their own direct connections, whereas this rib 7 actually connects directly to this, whereas ribs 8, or excuse me, 8, 9, and 10 actually connect to one common piece. And then ribs 11 and 12 are called floating because they don't connect to any uh, cartilage. They just kind of float in your back region. I want to say float. They're, <laughs> they're not just... They're, they're not floating around, but they are attached to the, 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 the facet on your vertebrae, but they don't come around and attach to any cartilage on the front. Now, the sternum kind of has three major parts to it. The manubrium, the top of it, the body, and the body of any bone is the main part, and then the pointed area at the bottom of it called the xiphoid process. So again, the overall bone is the sternum. Okay, The top part this area is called the manubrium. This area is called the body. And then the bottom part of it, the pointed area, is called the xiphoid process. So that finished up that part of the skeleton in the middle of the body called the axial skeleton. Now let's talk about what attaches to the axial skeleton, the appendicular skeleton. And the first two are in the upper part of the body, the clavicle and the scapula. Okay, here we see the clavicle, also called the collarbone. Notice it articulates with the manubrium of the sternum and also with what's called the acromial process of the scapula. So this is the clavicle, the collarbone. This is the scapula. Now the scapula has several parts to it. And here we see the spine of the scapula. Here we see projecting upward in it and actually articulating with the clavicle. We see the acromion process. And then in front of the acromion process, we see the, another protrusion off a coracoid process. And this has several muscles attaching to it. So again, the acromion, that top process that articulates with the actual clavicle. The coracoid process is a process below the acromion and also anterior to it that is going to uh, have a lot of muscle attachments to it. What's called the glenoid cavity, sometimes called the glenoid fossa, is going to be where it's going to be the socket for the ball and socket where the humerus fits into it. And then the spine is that slender, sharp portion.
Here we see that glenoid cavity where the humerus would fit into it. Here we see the acromion. Here on the back portion we see the spine. 